I'm here today at one of my favourite haunts. This is Abbey Bridge at Lanacost in Cumbria. You've seen it on the channel a few times before. But today I'm out here trying this. I've borrowed this. This is a Lumix GX7 from 2013. And I've got my 25mm Olympus lens on it. I'm going to go out and take some shots around here and just see what we can see. So come and join me. Roll titles. <laughs> Hi YouTube, Brian James, that Micro Four Thirds guy with you once again. It's been a little bit of a while since I was last on this video. You will find that there's lots of traffic noise or traffic going past in the background. It's one of those sort of places. But I'm here today at Abbey Bridge, which is at Lanacost in North East Cumbria. You've seen it on the channel several times before. It's one of my favourite, favourite places to come to. Beautiful little bridge here. Um, a, a Norman Abbey in behind, be, behind us, uh, ruins of that at the other side of the, the village. And a really, really nice place to be. Well today, as I say, I'm here with uh, a Lumix GX7. I'm trying this out. I've borrowed this from my colleague Paul, who's down there taking some photographs behind me, so you might see him on the video as we go around. And we'll just come out here just to try this out. And I've put my Olympus 25mm lens on the front of this one, and that's what I'm limiting myself to today. So everything I'm going to take today out here is going to be using just a 25mm lens and the Lumix. And I'm going to give you a few ideas as to what I'm thinking as I go through, and my opinion on this lens with this camera which is now 10 years old. So uh, come and join me. Now these are the sort of shots around here that I've taken hundreds and thousands of times, and they're still really give me a, a bit of pleasure when I'm doing them. I haven't had a great deal of pleasure in my photography recently. I've been doing all sorts of messing around things, but I've come back, as I say, to somewhere which I have an affinity with. And one of the things that I really love about here is coming here, you can maybe see the waterfall in a bit of the distance there, and you can hear, hopefully in the background, the flowing water. And I find that incredibly therapeutic when I'm out taking photographs. I love taking photographs of, of, those, sort of those sort of images, you know, the, the, the natural images that we have I find are really interesting and as much of my photography is about relaxing and enjoying myself as it is about pressing the shutter. In fact I can actually come out on a photo expedition and take no photographs sometimes because I get so lost in the atmosphere of where I am. But I do find something like this where underneath the bridge arch as you can see we've got the lovely waterfall just down but if I watch the water just easing past slowly then I find that that's really really interesting for me. And if there's a small seat or something like the, uh, the little abutment underneath the, the bridge arch, I can sit there for hours watching the water slowly flow past with all the, all the, the debris on the top, all the, uh, the flotsam and jetsam floating down on the top of the water as it goes gently past, especially on a still day like this where it, you can enjoy it. But that's also tempered by the change where you get the water coming from a water, a small waterfall like that which gives a bit of drama to that gentle scene. So I'm going to take a couple more photos. I'm going to see how we get on. It's a bit far for the 25mm lens, but we'll see if we can get some sort of scenes for that. The 25mm lens actually in here is a bit awkward because it's, it's a little bit too long. If I just turn the camera around, you'll be able to see the bob of the bridge there. And the 25mm lens is a little bit too long. Let's take a photograph of that and I'll show you what I mean because you can't get a decent shot on that because you're actually too close even though we're across the other side of the river. Now, 
that's taking the shot of the the bridge but I've only got part of it in there I'm going to take it take another one down towards the waterfall and it's probably going to be too far away from the 25 mil lens now I'm going to go slightly off to in front of you because I've got some foliage here which I want to clear I don't want that in the shot necessarily well maybe I will let's have, let's try let's try having that in and seeing what it's like on the other far one so I'm going to go in front first and that will show you on this let's have a look and see if we can get some of this foliage in what I think I'll do is I'll go really open on the uh, on the aperture on this shot I said I don't mess around much but when I need to I will I'm going to go really on open on the aperture and I'm going to try and get some of this plant life into the shot and try and have the back blurry maybe with the bridge there let's see how we get on with this so I can take it down to f1.8 And I'm having focusing on the focus problem, so I'm going to manual focus on this one and see how we get on. That's a couple of shots on that. Let's see what we get with these. I'm going to also open back, back up to about F4 and take the same shot and see what we get from there. Now the controls on this GX7 are very, very light, so I keep on managing to get it into playback mode or display mode so a little bit better again using a double control on there I can adjust my aperture here yeah, there's no stops on it whatsoever so I'm going to be very careful and I can play my exposure compensation by pressing it in so I've got it on F4 I'm going to take the same two shots again And you see there's a big difference between the uh, the bokeh and the background on that. So I've got it back to F4. I'm going to leave it on F4 for a little while. I will take a little wander and go up on top of the bridge and see if we can catch up with Paul because I haven't seen him since we started this video. And uh, I'm supposed to be doing a photo shoot together and I've sort of abandoned the guy. So let's see if I can find him up the top. Now this little camera is 10 years old now and um, it's a cracking little bit of kit. It's built like a brick, it really is. Um, this is the, um, the, the first in the line of these GX cameras which really um, was useful to me. The GX1 before it didn't have the electronic viewfinder on and I've actually done a review of my GX1 up there, you'll find the link. And that was a good little camera and I've been using it myself recently but this was a major step up. It had, it was still 16 megapixels. But the sensor was a much newer sensor on this camera than uh, the older ones. Came in with the same sort of built-in flash. I'll just see if I can release the flash there. Same built-in flash ideas in the GX1 and, and on later cameras in the GX line as well. Uh, but did come with an electronic viewfinder. Um, the electronic viewfinder on this is interesting and I do like electronic viewfinders. I really do like the idea of putting the camera up to my eye. And with it being this rangefinder type of style, which I've said on my GX8 reviews in the past, I do like it because having a rather large nose, it means that my nose sits at the side rather than stuck behind. The problem with it is it's a very, very small eyepiece on it. And I do find that a bit difficult. Now, again, as I said before, when doing the GX1 and cameras of that ilk, I, I'm not a great fan for using the rear screen. I always find it inconvenient, especially when there's bright, um, bright weather and it tends to obliterate what you can see. Well, this has been different. Using this rear screen, it's about a three um, million dot screen, and I found this to be really, really useful. The difference is on this one, it does have the, the tilt screen, so you can tilt it up and down. And I found that shooting from sort of just above waist height with that screen at that position is really, really useful. It doesn't get glared out by the sun. And I found it more enjoyable than using the, the little viewfinder. Now, as on the GX8, it does have the tilt viewfinder. Some can see uses for that, some others. And one of the things which is a bit strange on this is the diopter control. Instead of being a, a little circular wheel, it's a slider underneath. And that's great because when the viewfinder's down, it doesn't get knocked. It does make a bit of a pain to actually adjust it because you've got to lift this up and look down into it to adjust the diopter. The problem with it is, when it is up, it's incredibly easy to knock it. Um, swings and roundabouts, I think. I think I prefer the idea of a, a little round dial on the side. The other thing is that the automatic sensor for switching between the eyepiece and the, um, the screen is tucked right on the, this side here, right on the edge. 
So when you're doing anything with your hand there, as soon as it comes in near it, you tend to find your hand gets onto it and you lose your rear screen and flips back to the uh, to the eyepiece. Good and bad on that. It is a nice hold in the, in the hand. It's, as I say, it's a really nice body. It's solid. It's magnesium body on this. And um, it, it, it really is very, very strongly built. Hand piece, the, uh, the grip is small, considerably smaller than GX8, but it's neat. It's, it's comfortable in the hand and you don't feel as if you're going to drop the camera at all. As I say, I've been using it with the 25mm Olympus lens and I do find that it matches very, very nicely. The camera does have two axes in body stabilisation. Um, if you have a lens with, with in, in lens stabilisation on, it will defer to the lens. This came out the same time as the Olympus EM1 Mark I and that had the five axis. So this, although it was Olympus's first foray into a camera with image stabilisation, is considerably lacking in comparison to that one. And really, if you're going to use this, I would say your best bet is to use um, Lumix lenses with in, with in lens stabilisation on because it does actually do better than the dual axis in this. However, it's better than nothing and it works really rather well. Controls are neat. It does still have the pushy button on the back, uh, like the, the previous ones, to switch between modes. Um, but it also does have a front dial, so you can set your aperture and your speed on there and then by a click set up your, um, your exposure compensation. I quite like that, uh, although this dial, I don't know if it's because it's an older camera, this has been borrowed from a colleague Paul, um, I don't know if it's an older camera or if it actually came like this from you, but there are almost no indents on that. As soon as you touch it, it moves and that of course knocks your aperture or your speed or whatever you've got that dial set to. The rest of it is straightforward, standard Lumix on the back, uh, normal dial layout, and if I switch a camera on and put it into um, menu mode, it's a standard sort of Lumix menus. I don't know if you can see that in this light or not, but it's a standard sort of Lumix menus that you got, which are clear, easy, colourful, and quite intuitive, which I really like. Overall, the camera is good. It uses the same batteries as in my G100, which I'm using at the minute, which is ever so useful because I can share the batteries on it, which is the, uh, the, the BG10, the BLG10E battery. And uh, fit in the bottom, single card slot, uh, but just a really nice camera. Very, very nice in the hand. It's got all the bits and pieces on. I'm not going to go into the specs. But what I will say about this is this was, at the time, compared to the Olympus EM1 Mark I. And I've always felt rather unfairly, this is a totally different sort of feel that it's heading for. The EM1 Mark I was their professional camera which was released as a top of the range camera to do all sorts of wonderful things. It had um, battery grips that you could bond onto it and all sorts. This thing wasn't. It wasn't meant as that. And I don't think it's a very fair comparison insofar as the camera body itself. Insofar as performance though, this really gives the EM1 Mark I a run for its money. It is superb performance. The, the colours and the quality of the image on this are superb. As I say, it had a, an improved sensor over the previous 16 megapixel Lumix cameras when it came out. And it just works extremely well. Video-wise, if you're into videos, well, obviously you don't have the tilt-swivel screen. So if you're into the, the old selfie bits where you're doing something like I am to the site, you can't see yourself. But... Um, it's also a um, maximum of um, 30 frames per second 1080p so in today's 4k world it's been very well left behind but but most of my video work is done at 1080p either 25 or 30 frames per second anyway that I put on the YouTube so for me it's still con quite contemporary on that although it does have a crop even the 1080p it has a crop which I really don't like very much it takes your, it pays your money and takes your choice it was never meant as the big video camera. It was meant as a, a nice little hybrid. It does not have um, a microphone input or, an, or a, um, an earpiece output on it. So for video, you can't plug an external mic in. Although it does have a couple of little stereo microphones on the top, which work adequately enough. Um, but overall, really nice little camera. Very nice in the hand. Now you may see him Paul in the background over there, finally caught up with him. And he's out in the field doing macro shots. He's got the 60mm um, f2.8 macro lens from Olympus. With the one that I reviewed recently, and there's a review above it there. And he's taken that out to do some plant macro photography in the field there. And it really is interesting when you go out into nature like this, about the different styles of photography that you actually do have. Natural photography isn't one skill. It's very, very multi-skilled. You've got, a, you know, the, there's the macro which Paul's doing at the moment. 
if we're doing something if we, quite often we could be using really long lenses and doing landscape shots short lenses landscape shots you can be doing abstract shots all sorts of things all fall into nature photography and each of them have their particular place in people's hearts um, as I said during that macro video when I did it I've never really done much in a mere macro photography before and I enjoyed doing some of the shots I was taking. Now Paul seems to get a, a, a buzz out of that, but he also does a, an awful lot of wildlife, bird um, photography particularly. And some of his shots are fabulous. And, and one day I'll ask if, he, if I can put a video together of his shots because uh, they really are something special when you see them. Um, he's out today with uh, um, uh, um, his, his cameras, but also he's got his Sony. And I'll have to find out what, what, the, um, what the model is, I'll stick it. You'll see it on the screen here when I find out what it is. But it's a, a big um, bridge camera, really big with a fantastic zoom on it, but only a one inch sensor. But the results he gets from that are absolutely astounding when it comes to bird and wildlife photography. So don't be put off by having to have the right camera. You know, the right camera can be whatever you make it to be. And he's found that this uh, bridge camera really, really works very, very well for him. In preference, sometimes, to the, uh, the, the Micro Four Thirds cameras with a larger sensor. So never be put off by sensor size. There's an awful lot more to cameras and photography than just the sensor that you got in there. Um, so be, don't be afraid to experiment. Anyway, I'm going to take a little wander under the top of the bridge because I love the bridge on there. We can have a lovely look down the river. And I'll take some more shots with the GX7. I am enjoying it. It's on the wall beside me. I've got to be careful not to knock it off the wall because it's, it's not my camera. But um, I really do enjoy it. But let's go up on top of the bridge. Let's take some more shots. And I'll also do some more shots at the, at the end of the video as well. Now, before I do go, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do me a favor. I know we keep on asking these things, these, these YouTubers, but the things that we ask for really do make a difference to us. So if you're not a subscriber to the channel, please hit the subscribe button below. Join the 8,200 and odd people who are currently subscribers on the channel. We'd love to have you a part of, the little, of our little merry group. We've got some fantastic people on there. And while you're down there, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button, which gives a like to this video. Even if you don't like it, do it for me anyway. Because what that does is it gets YouTube's algorithms to spread the word more and more, puts out for more and more people to see, and hopefully they can join in. But whatever happens, leave me a comment what you think about nature photography, about the GX7, about anything you see in this video, leave me a comment below. Let's have a wander up top. Would I advise buying one? Well, second hand, they're going for less than 200 pounds on the likes of MPB. Um, but to be perfectly honest, now that I've used it, no I wouldn't. I love my GX8. The GX8 is the next generation of this. And it wasn't a direct replacement for the GX7. Uh, believe it or not, the direct replacement for this was the G80 or G85, depending on which country you're in. Or as they called it in Japan, I think it was the GX7 Mark II. And the GX8 is considerably bigger and heavier and chunkier than this camera. So the, G80, the G85 or the G80, whichever country, country you're in, it's a direct replacement for this and up the, the ante very much on that one and for less than £100 extra on, this, on the used market I would go for one of those. Of course a GX9 which is also I believe the um, GX7 Mark III in some markets, keep up because I'm getting lost. The GX9 is the current camera which is the, um, the, the, the leader in this sort of field and of course has full 4K video and a lot more on it but it's not a huge step up from this one. And if you're just after a really good camera for really good quality um, photographs and adequate quality video, you know, the, this or the GX80, 85 would be absolutely superb. Now the problem with giving yourself a one lens challenge is you're restricted to that one lens. And especially if that lens is a fixed focal length, if it's a prime lens. So I've got a lovely view in the background here of the, the, the river. Uh, this is the, the River Irthing, I believe. Yes, the River Irthing, which uh, goes out, eventually goes out through Carlisle and into the Solway Estuary, miles and miles away from here. But um, the problem that I have with doing something like this is, you see a shot and you think that's going to look fabulous, but you really, you have limited as what you can do. So you have to start really thinking out the box a little bit and seeing if the camera is going to have the focal length that you, the focal length that you need for this shot. Now. I've said before that I'm not the greatest fan of 25mm lenses. I prefer something just a touch wider normally if I'm doing um, normal shots, day-to-day -day, uh, run and gun shots. But the 25's got a bit of an advantage here because I actually want a little bit further reach to see some of that river. I don't know how it's going to work out. 
And what I'm going to do on this is I'm going to take a few shots. Um, again, round about F4. I think that's going to be adequate. It is going to be just a, a shot down the river, but if I can get something out of that river bend into it, I'll be, I'll be really, really happy. So I'm going to give this a go, see what I can do with it. Um, fingers crossed that the lens is going to be okay for this, because what I can see in front of me, I really love. Whether I can repl replicate that on my photograph, I don't know. So let's give it a try. Mind my back. Now one of the problems I've just had with that shot, there's a, a tree, a bush just below, and it does tend to, um, it does tend to, to complicate the foreground a little bit, make it a bit messy, but again, with having this one lens, I can't zoom past it and get anything into it. I may be able to crop it in post-production, we shall see, but um, I'm not really wanting to do any cropping in post-production on these, I want to just see what I can get photograph-wise and see if I can enjoy myself. But um, I'm going to take a wander onto the top of the bridge and see what we can get from there. Now many years ago when I first got into doing photography, I had a, a guy who mentored me by the guy Steve Hastings and he was a fabulous guy insofar as the knowledge he had. It wasn't technical but he just had common sense when it came to photography. And one of the things he said to me was make your feet move. Don't be afraid to make your feet move. Just a few feet maybe, a few metres, doesn't matter because you'll get a different shot. And if you remember just when I was what, 20 metres down the road there, I was saying about the difficulty I was getting taking the shot up the meandering river with uh, the fact that it was foliage anyway. Well, I've just come up here and you can see now that it's a very, very different shot. 20 metres away, a little bit further up the bridge, but very, very different. All the, the clutter, which was in the, big, in the front, has gone. So we've got a lovely shot of that river down there. And you can see the way that it's incredibly wide here and narrows down considerably as it gets a bit, um, well, 50, 60 metres away from here. We've got the lovely little waterfall, you probably can hear that in the background, and I'm going to take a shot of that from here now. But um, it's a different shot just by moving, you know, 20 metres away. Fabulous what you can do, and your whole viewpoint changes. And again, as I say, I'm using a fixed focal length lens, but suddenly this 25mm, which I wasn't so keen on down there, comes into its own. Now just take a couple of shots just looking up the bridge here and to give you an idea I was talking about um, the auto ISO, the aperture and the speed. Again I've got it set to f4, I find that's a really nice aperture for what I'm doing. Um, speed on those couple of works at about 6 40th of a second which is nice and quick, you're freezing uh, things that you need to without it being silly fast and making it difficult to actually uh, work properly. But also the ISO on this, on this rather cloudy day, the auto ISO is sitting at about at ISO 200 which is the the, the, the best on the Micro Four Thirds cameras, that's the, the ideal setting on these, that's the, the default good setting. So it's a very sensible um, way of shooting them when you let the camera take some of the control for you. And it allows you to concentrate on what you're taking the photograph of, rather than the techie side. And to me, I've talked about, in my last video I talked about the fact that I was not having fun with my photography so much, I wasn't enjoying myself. Well, today because I've just set it to a semi-auto mode with auto ISO, I've come out, I've had a little bit of a thing beforehand, but I've just got out and taken photographs. I haven't got anything particular to take photographs of today, I'm just doing it for the fun of it. And I'm having an absolute ball, I really am. Um, so if you are a bit stuck, just take those tips, set it to auto, go out, take some photographs and concentrate on the image rather than the technology. You know, one of the things I really love about coming out into the countryside and taking photographs, there's a couple just ridden past on push bikes. One's from Corbridge, the ladies from Corbridge, the, the gentleman's from Norfolk, right down the opposite end of the UK from where I am. And we just had a, the usual British discussion on the weather, because it's a beautiful day today, as they say, there's no real wind, it's there's a, um, probably seven eighths cloud, six or seven eighths cloud overhead, but it's, it's not unpleasant. And it's a nice temperature, the temperature's starting to rise a bit. So, and when you get these sort of things, everybody's curious as to what I'm doing with the camera out and, and what I'm trying to, what I'm, what I'm up to. And I, I take great pleasure in telling them what I'm doing, doing because it, it spreads what we do as a hobby further, further afield. But you can get some wonderful conversations with some really nice people when you're out and about. If you take the time to talk to them and they stop to talk to you. And I do find it's, again, it's part of that relaxation, it's part of that really enjoyable atmosphere that you can have taking photographs. 
and everybody's got a little story to tell. You always get some wonderful little stories about where someone's been or what they've done or what they've experienced, even if it's uh, fairly recent. But also, they want the people tend to be a, a little bit of a, 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 a sponge for what you want to give information. Well, and I was asked about how old this bridge was and about the abbey up the road and talking about this building behind which, when I first came here some 35, 36 years ago, um, it was, that was a, an active little hotel and public house. A uh, really nice place. Now a private dwelling, uh, like a lot of pubs in the UK, it's, uh, the business fell off for it. But it was really nice and to give something of the local history to a visitor, I find really enjoyable. We've enjoyed this video, it's been a little bit different than my normal ones and I think this is something of the style I'm going to carry on with in the future. Now I'd like to say a big, big thank you to these people here. Um, here. Can look on the screen on the side to find out where my fingers are. These people here, who are the supporters on my Patreon channel, um, you can't join my Patreon channel this month, you can't join in the month of May 2023, because what I've done is, because I didn't do any videos in April, I put a, um, a block on the, the payment so people haven't been paying me for something they haven't got. That also stops people joining, but when we get into the end of May, if you want to join the channel, there's a link below, please do that. But if you'd like to give me a one-off payment just to help the channel go as well, like these wonderful people have done with the Patreon, there's also a PayPal link below where you can buy me a cup of coffee, which helps keep the channel going. Now, before I finish off on this, I'm going to show you some more photographs at the end here. But um, before I do go, don't forget, keep on taking your camera out. Keep on having fun with your photography. I know I keep saying that every time, but really it is an enjoyable hobby i don't do it as a business anymore i do it for fun and enjoyment and when you get that fun factor back well these little boxes of tricks can do amazing things for your mind so have fun with your photography and i'll see you next time bye bye